Good morning. Welcome to First United Methodist Church. We are so glad you have chosen to worship with us this morning. We have a few announcements, few reminders for you. Uh, first, this coming Saturday is our Epworth Forest Workday, and we are so excited, so excited to get to participate in this opportunity to go out and clear some grounds for them and to make way for being able to have future programming out there at the campgrounds. Um, you do not have to be super limber or super physically fit in order to be able to help. Just uh, a willing heart is, is mostly what you need. If you are interested, you can uh, contact Nikki Gingrich, and she would be more than happy to get you signed up. She just wants to make sure we've got a good count of how many are going this Saturday. A reminder, if you are uh, caravanning from the church or riding in the church van, uh, we are meeting here at 8 a.m. We'll be back by 1.30. If you're meeting us out at the campground, it's 8.30 to 1. Lunch will be provided. Yes. Yes. Very excited. Nikki's back there. She's cheering. She's excited. We got, what, 20 people, I think, signed up already. So you know you want to be a part of this fun. It's going to be exciting. Um, our family will be out there. Um, Caleb will be out there. So, you know, who knows what we'll get into. Uh, we are doing our grief sermon series right now. And after service today, we will meet out at the pavilion for a bit of a response and reflection time. If you're interested in participating in that, I invite you to join me out at the pavilion. Um, a quick reminder from our response team. If you are uh, inside the building for any sort of church activities, please don't forget that you need to wear a mask, social distance, and sign in so that we can be sure uh, that we're paying attention to all of the rules and regulations given for us. Um, so we continue to try to figure out the best way to lead this church and to be, um, be good stewards of what we have been given and figure out how to love our neighbors well. Finally, we are excited. Caleb is going to be leading our children's moment this morning. And so I'm going to invite any of our kiddos to go ahead and start to wander up this way because I know it takes you all a minute to get up here. Um, and so Caleb will be up here after our call to worship for children's moment. So if any of our kiddos want to start wandering this way, they are welcome to do so. I'm excited about what God has in store for us today. I'm excited to discover that alongside of you and excited to be, um, to be receptive to be seeking and to be attentive to the God who has met us here in this space. So would you tune your hearts to God with me during our call to worship? In the midst of struggle and strife, God is with us. Praise be to God for God's steadfast presence. Even though we carry the scars of loss, disappointment, and grief, God is with us. We seek God's mercy and grace to heal our wounded souls. Come, bring your needs and wants to God, for God will hear your cries and restore your souls. Praise be to God for mercy, peace, and hope. Amen. Come on, guys. You can join me up here. Fun little space up here. Also, it's an awesome sweatshirt. Totally approve. So, <clears throat> all right. So, this morning, uh, our kind of big idea is uh, our scars tell stories. And I was just kind of thinking and reflecting on that and um, going through some of what the Bible says and some stories. And then I was like, scars and stories. And, uh, you know, what, uh, what are some good stories and wanting to tell uh, just kind of a, you know, a good Bible story about that. And I was going through and flipping through. And there's so many things that, uh, you know, that we've gone through where um, some hard times um, that we've we've gone through that have produced scars. I know for me physically right here, you see this big old scar. You know, I broke my arm in two different places. And because of that, I have this big old nasty scar. And now I have an awesome story I get to tell people that's pretty embarrassing on my part. Um, I ran into a wall. I was literally, I was, uh, I was like 17 years old and I was just running around to hit a wall. You know, not, not exactly the funnest of stories to tell about that. Um, but a lot of times we go through life and our scars are produced because 
uh, we've been hurt somehow. Uh, and sometimes they're physical and sometimes uh, they don't, they are not seen, uh, but rather they are felt. And, and so I was going through and, um, and going through some of the Bible and uh, came across this character. His name is Thomas. Now, he's also got a nickname. Does anyone know what his nickname, this Thomas guy is? Well, his nickname is Doubting Thomas uh, because he was not very sure about the resurrection of Jesus, right? And he, and he wanted proof. He wanted, I, I, want, I want to know that Jesus is back and alive. And so when Jesus came to, this, to Thomas, he said, look, look at my scars. Look at these wounds uh, that I have. Uh, look at my hands where the nails have been pierced. And look at my feet where the, where the nails have been pierced as well. And so Jesus, right? So the man who is fully God and fully man who died for us has a story to tell because of his scars. And not only does he have scars because he was pierced and upon a cross, but he has scars to tell as well from grief. So he was betrayed by a close friend. He was hurt by that emotionally as well. And so he was, when he came back, uh, when he was resurrected three days later, he was able to tell that story. He was able to look at Thomas and say, look, this is what I have gone through. This was painful and this hurt, but now I'm here for you. And so it's good to know that we serve someone who has been hurt. He knows what it's like to be hurt physically and emotionally. And so when we go through those times, when people hurt us uh, emotionally with some harsh words, when people hurt us physically, when we fall down and get hurt, scraped knees, broken arms, uh, we know that uh, that pain uh, is only temporary. But also we know that we can always go to someone and we serve a God who has gone through that pain and has gone through that suffering, and has stories to tell from his scars. And so I know a lot of us have gone, some of us may have gone through some pain and some struggles, and uh, there'll be some stories to tell for that. Uh, but I wanted to share a story uh, of Doubting Thomas, who uh, was given the story by Jesus uh, of some grief and of some pain, uh, and to know that we can always go to Jesus uh, when we have pain with the understanding of he knows. Uh, not only because he knows us, but he also went through it. So to me, that's pretty comforting to know. All right? So let's go ahead and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, thank you uh, for coming down uh, in human form and going through pain, going through betrayal, um, so that we may be saved. Um, you have scars that tell a story. Uh, as do we all. Uh, and so I pray that we would look to that story of your scars uh, and know uh, that we may be comforted uh, in the midst of our grief, in the midst of our struggles, uh, Lord. And I want to thank you for these kiddos um, and their willingness to come up here and learn more about you. It's always amazing uh, to see that. And you said, you know, with a childlike faith is how we enter into the kingdom of heaven. Uh, and so, uh, these kiddos have a lot to teach us, uh, just as much as we have to teach them. And so I want to thank you for them uh, and, their, uh, and what I can assume to be smiles underneath these masks and willingness to learn more about you. And so we thank you and we praise you uh, in your heavenly name. Amen. To brag on someone who is not here this morning, and that is Jean Weaver, our administrative assistant. And I tell you, you know, I've served in several different churches, and Jean is one of the absolute best that I have worked with. Yes. She is just, she's amazing and she's incredible. And she has had to deal with so much in the midst of all of this transition, not only a pastoral transition, but also a transition with the pandemic. She's had this uh, just huge load on her shoulders and she has handled it with grace. 
And if you have not recently taken the time to thank her for all of the things that she does and the myriad of things that we have no clue that she does to keep this place running, please take some time to call her, to email her, to uh, send her a card in the mail, something just to thank her for all of the things that she does. Um, but I want to remind you, because you give, we have amazing staff members like Jean who is able to provide things like bulletins and videos and Facebook updates and the, keeping the website up to date and taking care of all the tiny details and helping a pastor like me figure out what's going on in a brand new church and a brand new community. We have the opportunity to give for so many reasons. We give because our God is generous to us. We give because we are givers by nature. We give um, because because of God's generosity. And so I invite us to consider the ways in which we've been blessed, the ways in which God has been generous with us, and to search our hearts and our minds and our souls for the ways in which God is asking us to be generous in return. As we prepare for prayer this morning, a reminder to consider those prayer requests that have been shared in your small community, those that have been listed in the bulletin, those that uh, you are aware of, as well as those that have not yet found words to be spoken. Um, and also, uh, in particular, I want to make sure we're remembering those impacted by the wildfires out west. Would you join me in prayer, please? Good and gracious God, we are gathered here in the midst of your presence, always in the midst of your presence. There are times when that, that cool breeze hits our face and it reminds us of the presence of the Holy Spirit surrounding us, lifting us, encouraging us, spurring us on, challenging us to, the pe to be the people that you call us to be. As we feel the warmth of our sun on our faces, we're reminded of the love and the grace with which you surround us. We ask, oh God, in these moments, in this time of worship, that we would be lifting our eyes and our hearts toward you, that we would take the burdens and the sorrows and the griefs that we carry and for a moment lay them down at your feet to offer them to you, to allow you to do something with them. So often we hold so tightly onto all of these things that we're experiencing, the pain that we hold onto, the grief that we walk with, we hold so tightly, we forget to let go for a moment so you can mold and shape and renew and restore. Because you are, oh God, a God of restoration, a God of renewal, a God who desires to redeem in each and every moment. May we have the courage to let go enough that you can move in with that restoration and with that redemption. God, we are leaning into you today. Some days it is so hard to lean upon our own strength, to lean upon our own knowledge, to lean upon all of the faculties that you have given to us. And you remind us then in those moments, oh God, that we are not designed to do this on our own but that you provide us the strength that we need, the courage that we need, the presence that we so desperately desire. We are thankful, God, that we are gathered in community today, that though it feels a bit different, that we are still gathered. We are still present with one another. Help us to figure out ways to continue to remind one another of our presence with one another and the presence of Christ in each of us. May we represent Christ to one another. So God, we lift up our sorrows and our griefs as well as our joys and our celebrations, knowing that you hear each of them, you respond to each of them. May our worship be for you and not for us. We are thankful for your presence and for the peace that you provide and we ask that you would remind us of all of this as we pray together the prayer taught to us by Jesus by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power 
and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from Genesis 21, 8 through 21. The boy grew and stopped nursing. On the day he stopped nursing, Abraham prepared a huge banquet. Sarah saw Hagar's son laughing. The one Hagar, the Egyptian, had born to Abraham. So she said to Abraham, send this servant away with her son. This servant's son won't share the inheritance with my son Isaac. This upset Abraham terribly because this boy was his son. God said to Abraham, don't be upset about the boy and your servant. Do everything that Sarah tells you to do because your descendants will be, taste, will be traced through Isaac. But I will make your servant's son a great nation too because he, because he also is your descendant. Abraham got her up early the next morning, took some bread and a flask of water, and gave it to Hagar. He put the boy in her shoulder sling and sent her away. She left and wandered through the desert near Beersheba. Finally, the water in the flask ran out, and she put the boy down under one of the desert shrubs. She walked away from him about as far as a bow shot and sat down, telling herself, I can't bear to see the boy die. She sat, a di she sat at a distance, cried out in grief, and wept. God heard the boy's cries, and God's messenger called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, Hagar, what's wrong? Don't be afraid. God has heard the boy's cries over there. Get up. Pick up the boy and take him by the hand because I will make him a great nation. Then God opened her eyes and she saw a well. She went over, filled the water flask, and gave the boy a drink. God remained with the boy. He grew up, lived in the desert, and, beca and became an expert archer. He lived in in the Paran Desert, and his mother found him an Egyptian wife. We thank you for the word of God in Scripture, for the word of God within us, and the word of God among us. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we are thankful to you for your presence here with us and your presence here within us. And we ask now, oh God, this word, this message that has been prepared, may it be of you, may it be from you. And may our hearts and our ears and our lives be open and ready to receive whatever it is you have for us this day. We ask it in your name. Amen. Several years ago, Josh and I got interested in a show on TV called Tattoo Nightmares. And it featured real people who had gotten these tattoos over the span of their lives. And some of them were just really poorly done. And some of them were reminders of really negative experiences in their lives. And so they had gone to these really talented uh, tattoo artists to get them covered up. And they covered them up with something beautiful and something amazing. And it was fascinating to hear the stories that were told through these things. Imagine then my fascination when I discovered another type of cover-up tattoo, and these are scar tattoos. These are people who've had significant scars, usually from uh, surgeries or some sort of significant thing in their life, um, and they would have tattoos that match the shape or tell the story of how they got that particular scar. 
So someone who had attempted suicide and had uh, marks on their wrist from that experience replaced it with a Sylvia Plath quote that said, I am, I am, I am. Someone else had deep indentations on their leg, maybe from having some pins removed or some sort of surgery, and they had these beautiful flowers tattooed on their leg, and the pistols, the center of those flowers, went right where those indentations were. Or maybe women who've had mastectomies, and they've covered up those scars with flowers. But my favorites are the ones that actually incorporate the scars into the particular tattoo lines that become like a fish, and it's the bones of the fish, and they tattoo a head and a tail on either end of it. Um, Or the line becomes the stem of a flower. Or there was this deep uh, C-shaped one that turned into the center part of peacock feathers. Or a spool of thread next to the line where they look like they've actually stitched over the different spots or or zippers or even like the really silly ones. Somebody had a, a curve on their elbow and they put two dots over it to make a smiley face. What I love most about these is the fact that they become a conversation starter because they tell a story. Whether we realize it or not, our scars tell stories. So as we consider this idea this morning, as we focus in on this morning's scripture, we're going to tell the story of Hagar and her scars. To give you a bit of context, Abram, a descendant of Noah, marries Sarai, and we hear from moment one, she's introduced as Abram's wife, who cannot have kids. Bit of foreshadowing there. And a couple of things happen along the way, including Abram taking the time to pretend that Sarai is his sister, which gets Pharaoh all frustrated and confused and turns into this conflict. And it's this whole thing. But anyway, eventually, Abram has a conversation with God where God says, hey, I want to remind you, I have promised to protect you. And in so doing, Abram, I want to promise you descendants that are as numerous as the stars in the sky. As countless as the number of grains of sand on the beach. And Abram says, yeah, but I don't have any kids. I don't know, maybe we'll have the head of my household. His son will become my heir. God says, no. I'm going to give you a biological kid. Just hang on. It's going to happen. Well, meanwhile, his wife, Sarai, is frustrated. She lives at a time where it's a cultural disgrace to be a woman who is not having children. I mean, the only way a woman would have social standing at this time in their lives would be to bear children, especially a son who could become an heir. So instead of waiting on God to fulfill God's promises, she decides to take matters into her own hands. She notices Hagar, one of these servants that serve there in the household, and she offers Hagar to Abram. She says, well, maybe Hagar will provide a child for me. Now, this isn't a new idea. It was something that was generally acceptable. The husband would take on a second wife, usually a servant from the household, and then the first wife would adopt said child, allowing that first wife to regain her social standing. Well, Abram, ever the passive one, doesn't put up a fight. It's like, well, if you insist. And Hagar becomes pregnant. And this is when things get really complicated. Sarai is angry at Hagar. She's probably jealous at the apparent success that she's had with Abram. And then Hagar despises Sarai. Now, we now know through scientific um, advances that infertility issues aren't necessarily the result of any one particular partner based on their gender. It can happen to anyone. Um, But they didn't know that then. And if something went wrong, it was always the woman's fault. And so as Hagar buys into what everyone else is talking about, she too despises Sarai because what good is Sarai if she can't have any children? So Sarai mistreats Hagar, makes life miserable for her, and Hagar says, hey, I don't have to put up with this, and she runs away. But God encounters Hagar as she flees, and she goes, hey, he says, hang on a second, you've got to go back. Like so many of our griefs, it feels like there is no escape, no reprieve, no release. It's that statement of, I wish I could wake up from this nightmare. And aren't there days that we wished for that? Days where we said, man, can't today just be easy? Can't we just have one day of peace and tranquility? Just for one day, can I pretend that the troubles of the world do not exist 
And Hagar has been psychologically, mentally, emotionally, and who knows, maybe even physically abused. How her soul must hurt. And all she wants to do is escape, but relief cannot yet come. And for whatever reason, she is sent back into the fray. And eventually her son Ishmael is born. Well, many years later, Abram and Sarah, no longer Abram and Sarah, now Abraham and Sarah, they've had their son Isaac. And as Isaac comes of age, they throw a huge party and Ishmael gets targeted at this party. Now, maybe he's laughing too loud. Maybe he's made fun of Isaac. Maybe he's just having too much fun. Whatever case, Sarah's still angry and frustrated and bitter. And that just throws her over the edge. And so Hagar and Ishmael are kicked out for good. Now Abraham gives a small kindness to them. He says, here is a small flask of water and a little bit of bread. But the desert is a harsh climate and it wouldn't have lasted for very long. And Hagar's convinced this is it. And she cries out in grief. And as Ishmael's name indicates, God hears. That's what Ishmael means. God hears. God hears the cries of the broken, of the oppressed, of the abused, of the lonely. God's physical care and concern for Ishmael, providing water and direction. God's physical care and concern for them becomes a reminder to Hagar that God hears. That God walks with her. That God would not leave her alone to fend for herself. That God is very much present even in the midst of her suffering. As we talk about scars this morning, I want to backtrack for half a second and say, where do we get scars from? Our own physical scars? Wounds. You get a scar because of a wound in your life. Um, I've had five surgeries throughout my life, three of them from C-sections from my beautiful children, and you better believe that I have scars on top of uh, glorious stretch marks. There was literally a wound inflicted on my body. They literally cut me open. And even for such a beautiful thing as birthing a baby, I bear the scars as a reminder. Our scars tell stories. Now, scars, first of all, can tell us what we've been through. As a family, we have always dealt with difficult things with humor. Uh, call it what you will, a defense mechanism, gallows humor, insanity, I don't know. But it helps us. With Nathaniel, as we began to understand the uh, scars that he would live with from donor sites, from skin grafts, from his initial burns, we began to talk about his scars and we'd joke about it, much as Caleb was talking about, you know, what stories is he going to tell his friends someday? Because I'm certain that whatever he comes up with, that imagination of his, will be far more interesting and entertaining than the actual truth. But in reality, the evidence of his wounds began to show up in unexpected places. For each of our kiddos' first birthdays, we took them to a pottery place, and they've got those tiles and we had them imprint their hand on a tile. We've got them hanging up in our house. And without even realizing it, the hand that Nathaniel used was the less burned of the two, probably the one that was available at the time. And you can still see the scars across his palm. And my immediate response was grief. Not even that was untouched by this incident in our lives. And then immediately following that was it's part of his story. It's a part of who he is. It's a part of his healing. Why would we want to hide that? And we do that, don't we? We try to hide our scars. We try to hide our wounds, forgetting the stories that they tell and that they remind us of how far we've come and how much we have healed. And as our scars show us where we've been, they also teach us. Nathaniel knows not to go near hot fireplaces. We know to check the temperature of the glass. Uh, sometimes wounds come from unhealthy places, so we need to learn new boundaries. If an individual has wounded us, then sometimes we create a new boundary where we don't trust them with as much as we trusted them with before. Maybe we learn about things that are not safe for us. We know what situations trigger us or which things we can only take in small doses, and we adjust because we learn. But even more so, scars show us our strength and our courage. 
More often than not, when we look back on our own scars, we start to realize and ask ourselves, how did I survive that? We realize how strong we really are, how much courage we actually have, and we realize the importance of our village and the presence of our God. Scars remind us that we were wounded and we are now on a path to healing. Scars can also tell us where we are going. What we've learned is that scar tissue, that um, scarred skin is a bit thicker, a bit tougher, sometimes a bit gnarly. And it reminds me that we can now endure a bit more. I remember having a lengthy debate with a nurse after I had given birth to my first child. And she needed to remove the staples from that C-section incision. And I was terrified because staples. And she said, you've just had a C-section. I think you can handle this. We may not immediately be ready for harder things. And again, wounds and scars are not intended to prepare us for something bigger and something harder. But it does give us perspective if something bigger and harder comes up. I'm pretty sure that if we all make it through this pandemic, we're going to be able to conquer the world. The other thing about scars, they become a conversation starter, especially if they are visible. Many of the scars that we carry are invisible. They're often not brought to light, especially if they're emotional or mental or psychological. But if we're willing to share about them, We might be amazed how much someone else needed to hear our story. Personally, I have had significant loss in my life, uh, not necessarily related to death, but things that I have grieved, things that I have experienced, things that are now a part of my story that I'm sure at some point will be part of a sermon illustration. But often, as I share my own story, the narrative of the scars of my life, what I find is there are others who relate who needed to know that I survived and who needed to know that I too walk with those scars. You will not know who needs to hear of your wounds or your scars until you share. You know, we never really forget where our scars come from. 99 times out of 100, if you ask someone, hey, where'd you get that scar? They're going to be able to tell you. They're always a part of us and that's okay. It's good to remember. It's good to name our wounds and our scars. But then the more difficult question becomes, what will we choose to do with it? There are two ends of the spectrum that you can land on first. We can choose to let our grief harden us. There's an old adage, wounded people wound people. Meaning we act out of our pain and our loss and our grief. And in so doing, we hurt others. Because when we're wounded, we have a tendency to wound others. Our wounds can harden us, can cause us to hold grudges, to harbor resentment, to become angry and bitter, maybe even lash out. I would argue, Sarah probably found herself in this camp. She was so wounded by the situation with Hagar, that the only path forward that she could see was through her woundedness to cause oppression and abuse and ultimately exiling Hagar and Ishmael. So we can let our grief harden us. Or we can find the redemption. God is always in the business of redemption, constantly trying to bring about restoration. How do we set things right? When we experience the loss and grief, we have an opportunity to learn. Now, sometimes as we lean into God's restorative work, sometimes we learn that those lessons are for ourselves. Uh, We learned that we need to overcome our fear. As an example, as a child, my dad taught me how to play softball in the backyard tossed me the ball. I hit it with my bat, lost sight of it. Didn't realize I'd hit a pop fly until it landed crashing on my head. And the first thing dad said was, you got to get back on that horse. You got to try again. You got to not let the fear of getting hit (laughs) keep you paralyzed. Maybe what we learned for ourselves is to set new boundaries, 
or we learn how to become a more whole human. Maybe what we learn is something that will benefit others. When we share our stories or we share our experiences, we benefit others by encouraging them or even creating programs and experiences to help people process through their own journey. We can allow our grief to help us find the redemption. The question before us today is where are you allowing your grief to take you today? Whatever it is that you've brought with you, whatever it is that you're working through, whatever that grief thing is that we talked about in that first week, whatever it is that you have here today, how are you responding? Because our scars tell stories, but we get to choose which story they are telling. Even now, in the midst of of the grief that we are collectively experiencing, we get to choose what we're going to do with it. Are we gonna sit and complain? Are we gonna argue? Are we gonna yell until we get our way? Are we gonna allow our, over, our frustrations to overtake us and to ruin our relationships with others? Are we gonna get bitter? Are we gonna be stubborn? Or are we going to get creative and innovate? Michelangelo, once said that he criticizes by creating beautiful things. We grieve the loss of our normalcy. Our alternative to complaining and our alternative to criticizing is creating and innovating and making something new and beautiful. Taking all of that energy that we could spend being angry and bitter and moving it into creating something beautiful. What new opportunities do we have? What might creating something new look like? How do we want to spend our energies? Do we want to be angry and bitter or do we want to create and innovate? How do we make something good out of the pain that we experience? Today, do you find yourself like Sarai and operating in your woundedness in such a way that it wounds others? Or are you more like Hagar, where in your woundedness you are leaning into adaptation and growth, even in the face of pain? You see, God can always do something with whatever it is that we're willing to offer. Whatever woundedness we'll hand over, whatever scars have begun to form, whatever pain we've bottled up, God will take it all and work it for the good of restoration. But we have to consciously make the choice. We have to intentionally choose to allow God to redeem our pain, our loss, and our grief for God's good. May it be so for all of us. Amen. I'm going to close with a hymn, It Is Well With My Soul.
As we prepare to leave, a reminder um, that we will have our response session out at the pavilion after uh, we are finished uh, seeing people through the receiving line as well. Caleb and Bree and maybe even Atlas, if we're lucky, uh, will join uh, me under the portico to say bye. Um, please remember, if you've got name tags, always helpful. If you share names, always helpful. We're all still learning um, a lot of names. And in the meantime, may the God who redeems all of our wounds and all of our scars be with you and give you peace. Amen.